Good morning. Nice cold morning. You know, something about being in Iowa that we should be used to this, but we're not, apparently. Because it sounded like the whole state was going to die if they went outside. <laughs> you guys proved that wrong. I mean, back in, my, so back in my day, I'm a little bit older. Back in my day, I actually had a paper route as a kid and lived with my grandparents, and she would put this scarf all around me, so nothing but my eyes stuck out. In fact, it would be so cold, you'd have to take your glove off and melt your eyelashes, the snow that was on there, so you could keep your eyes open, right? And the only way people knew that it was so cold you could die is by me delivering the paper to them. There was no other way to know that. And so uh, it was important that I got the paper delivered, but... Uh, uh, hey, it's uh, is wind chill a real thing? I say it's not. It's a dry cold. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a lie. Anyway, uh, we're talking today about resetting. And uh, the idea of resetting is that maybe you had a year, 2017, that wasn't a spectacular year. Maybe some things happened you just wish would not have happened. Maybe you wish you could change some things. Uh, maybe you just kind of want to start over. And, um, you know, maybe some of those were like relationship things. Maybe you looked at some of your relationships and thought, you know what, I, I just need to start over. I need to reset this. I need a brand new opportunity to try to make things work. And so, heck, how do I just start over? Well, God is all about starting over. In fact, God is not about starting over once, but Pretty much every single day. In fact, when you look at uh, God's relationship with David, King David, you'll find out that God said he was the apple of his eye. Why? I think one of the reasons was is that David messed up a lot, and every single day he started over. He says, reset, you know, yesterday was bad. Uh, yesterday I wasn't who I wanted to be. Yesterday things didn't work out. Boom, reset, and he would start over again and again and again. There's something about being human that we think we have to get it right. And that if we get everything right, that says something really valuable about us. But if we mess up, then there's something really wrong with us. And yet God says, listen, your greatest deeds are nothing but filthy rags to me. Uh, you can't even come close to getting it right. And God says he's really okay with hitting the reset button. So today, kind of what I want to look like, or look like... <laughs> Who do I look like? Uh, what I want to talk about is hitting the reset button. And what does it look like to be a Christian? What does it look like to be a believer? Let's say we had a particularly bad year. What does it look like to say, okay, I'm going to start over. I'm going to start over with my Christianity. I'm going to start over with my faith. I'm going to start over with my life. What does that look like? So let's jump in this morning. Uh, 2 Timothy this is a great piece of scripture. Here he's telling Timothy something really important about his faith walk. He says, but you, Timothy, must remain faithful. He's telling him, you've got to really be faithful. You've got to stick it out. You've got to work through it all the way to the end. In fact, it's easy to be faithful when things are going right, right? It's easy to say, well, thank you, God, when I got a new car, when I got a new a uh, new spouse, when I got uh, any kind of thing in my life that, that I've really been wanting. It's hard, it's hard to be faithful when things are not working out. And as I say that, uh, several people come to my mind who I just kind of think, you know, are in those last days of their life maybe on this earth. And, and still I see them as extremely faithful people. Uh, they clearly see God's plan. They clearly believe this is not the end, but the beginning. And, and they're trusting God with their moments left here as well as their eternity, which stands in front of them. So he's telling Timothy, you must remain faithful to the things you have been, been, been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood. And they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. He goes on, and this is really important. He says, all scripture is inspired by God. He's saying, Timothy, all scripture, this entire thing, this, this Bible, all of this is inspired by God. Every last word of it. 
What we like to do today is go, you know what, I believe this part about God loved me, but when God says I shouldn't do this, yeah, I don't believe that part. Well, that's not for today. Well, that's not for me. Maybe that works for you, but it's not for me. And what he's telling Timothy, he's saying, listen, the only way you can judge your life, the only way you can come to the right conclusion on these things are by the word of God. Because every last piece of scripture is inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. That's a really, really important piece of scripture. In fact, if you want to live the kind of life that God wants you to live, you have to grasp the, the um, immensity of that. Uh, we live in a world, like I said, that doesn't want to believe that there is a way to do this or, or that you have to be this way or that way. And yet God works within all of our personalities. He still clearly says, listen, here's the way I want you to live. Here's the way I do not want you to live. Here's the things that will bless you. Here's the things that will not bless you. And to believe anything other than that is really kind of insanity. God who grew us, God who developed us, God who created us, God who gives us our breath, God who has given us our, our incredible families, God who has blessed us with all kinds of things, to believe that he's wrong on something or he doesn't know something is really just kind of insanity. We are essentially the worm looking at the bird going, yes, you, you can't tell me what to do. God being all-powerful. God being creator of us has spoken and he said, listen, this word that I've given you, this is me speaking to you about what matters. You need to know that this is the piece that can define your life and your world. Not the media, not Hollywood, not the news, not your neighbors, not your parents. That I have laid out your path for you and that path is found in scripture. So where do you start? If you're going to hit the reset button, where do you start? It always starts with, with knowing Jesus. And clearly, here's the scripture that tells us that. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If you openly declare that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Now, we push back against that, and we go, wait a minute, um, I, should, I should work at really being good if God is going to love me, or if God is going to accept me. And yet, Scripture, which God says is, is His Word, and which is all guaranteed by Him to be what He says it is, He says, that's not the deal. He says, you can't work your way to me. The only way to get to me is through my son Jesus and you believing that I've rescued you by placing him in this world to die and bear your sins. You believing that that's my plan and believing that he raised from the dead, that is the thing that is going to give you eternity. And it doesn't quite set with us because we want to have some kind of mark, some kind of goal where we can say, hey, say here's the deal. So I did these things. Now I'm good enough. But God says he will not let us ever say that. He will not let us say, listen, I got to figure it out. I went to the right church. I said the right prayers. I gave the right amount of money. And thus God said, I'm good. God is not going to let that happen. And he's forcing us here to really realize, to confess with our mouths that God, you are Lord. And you gave us Jesus. And you raised him from the dead. He's pressuring us and saying, this is the only way you can come to me. And that is through Jesus Christ, believing that he is God. So when you make that commitment, and if you've never made that commitment, it is absolutely uh, the most important thing you'll ever do. Uh, it, it is the thing that, that everything in your life, if you want to reset your life, if you want to change your life, if you want to head in a new direction, that moment of you confessing who Jesus is, saying, God, I don't have this all figured out, but I need you to help me. I need you to to lead me to be the kind of person you want me to be, that moment is the most important piece 
uh, in your life. It's the most important moment that can ever come to you. If you have not done today, that, that is where you start. So once you've started with Jesus, you're going to get four gifts. And these four gifts are essentially gifts that are given to you immediately. I want to look through those. Here's the first one. Immediately, you get a new God-centered view of you. What does that mean? Uh, 2 Corinthians says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Immediately, you get a new God-centered vision of you. Christ comes to live in you. Now, here's the kicker. He comes to live in you, but you get to decide, who am I going to be today? Am I going to allow Jesus to work through me, treat people in the way that he wants me to? Or am I going to be my mean, old, nasty self? You get to decide that. The scripture tells us that there is an old man, essentially, that lives in us. And that it wars against the new man or the new spirit that God has given us. So God says, you can have a new God-centered vision for yourself, for your life. But you're really going to get to be in control of it. You're going to get to decide how much you look like Jesus, how much you act like Jesus, how much you love other people. You get to decide that. And part of our Christian walk, part of our Christian faith is wrestling with that every single day. The second thing you'll get is this. Uh, God will give you a new name. Uh, When you get married, something uh, for women, when you stop and think about it, it's like this is really hard. Um, the moment they're, they're married, they start using the name of the person that they just married, the man that they just married. Now, we, we kind of accept that. We just go, well, that's just the way it is. But, but um, as I've done weddings and I've, I've done, you know, okay, we're going to sign the marriage license. I've had brides go, why do you spell that that way? Your, your name would be so much easier if you just took that letter out of there. And, and uh, you know, or I've had brides sign it and sign their new name as their old name, forgetting that they just agreed to change and receive this other name. And so it's kind of an odd thing culturally that we do. Uh, you kind of uh, move into this situation with this person. You're headed down this new uh, road together, and, and you're going to join your names together in, in one. And that's really kind of the purpose of it. And at the same time, it feels a little bit awkward. I think, I think uh, when, I, when we got married, Terry and I got married, um, she was ready for it because she like practiced writing that last name for about, what, three years? Is it three? Yeah, three years. Yeah, so three years, you know, she, I think she was trying to lead me to the altar. It did work eventually, but she kept practicing, you know, Terry Minx uh, rather than, than Blaze. So, uh, so, so that last name and that change of that is an important thing. And God will give us a new name. It says in Isaiah 62, it says, And you will be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. Now, he's not talking about a new last name, but he's talking about a new identity. See, your identity can be tied in who you were. Your identity can be tied up in what you do as a living. Well, I'm a lawyer. I'm, I'm a doctor. One of the first questions that we always ask people when we meet them, well, tell me what you do. Well, I'm a carpenter, or, well, I'm a teacher, or right now, I just play Xbox, you know, whatever it is. Uh, we, We tend to ask people for their identity, and God, in giving us a new name, is saying, I've given you a new identity. In fact, he tells us that we become children of God. Our, our thought is that everyone is children of God. Everyone is a creation of God. But not everyone is a child of God. Those who accepted him, accepted his plan for Jesus rescuing us, those people he gave the right to be called children of God. And so he gives us that identity. My identity, my new name, is tied up in who he is. He's my father. He is my Lord. He is the one who instructs my life. He is the one that that I give and surrender to. And so he's given me a new name as a child of his. I belong to him. The third thing you'll get is God will give you a new purpose. Uh, Just like he did in the Old Testament or in the New Testament uh, with the disciples, he gave them a new purpose. He says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. God's purpose in our life is to use us to grow his kingdom. 
hear people all the time say, I'm just trying to find my purpose. You, you don't have to find it. It was found for you. In fact, it was given to you. You may be saying, I'm trying to find my occupation. I understand that, and, and it's important to do the right work, the hard work in, of finding out where you belong, what works best for you and your family, and that becomes your occupation. But in your occupation, God's purpose for you is that you would grow his kingdom, is that you would spread seed of who Jesus is. Now, does that mean that you should buy a megaphone, stand in the street corner, and, and preach all day? No, it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that as God works through you in your occupation, even if you're a stay-at-home mom, that you are teaching other people. You are spreading God's seed of, of who he is and of the realities of being a Christian. Your purpose is to bring other people to the realization of who Jesus Christ is, whether that's loving them in the moment, whether that's helping someone across the street. Your purpose is to be God, to be Jesus in the life of everyone you see and meet. And if you're like me, some days my purpose is to just get up mad and be unhappy and be complaining. Usually that happens on Monday. I try to contain it there. But, but sometimes we think that's our purpose. But our purpose is to be used by God to grow his kingdom. Okay? Here's the fourth thing. God will give you a new future. God wants to give you a new future. Now, you may have come to know Christ and, and then decided, you know, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? But God wants to give you a new future. And that new future is in eternity with him. Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me. Heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul, who was Saul before he met Jesus, who murdered Christians, who had them killed, who had a super intellect, who was well-educated, who was to every Jew of the time a, a very well-put-together man, very well-put-together spiritual being. That man says, after meeting Christ, listen, I'm going to forget the past, and I'm going to press on towards doing what God wants me to do. I'm going to pursue diligently becoming like him, listening to him, reading his word, pursuing other people, finding my purpose as he works through me. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to forget my past. Now, here's the thing. All of those four things tend to be and can be a little bit heady. We can look at them and go, yep, yep, that's okay. Sure, yeah, I got that. Uh, when essentially Christianity is a way of life. And so if you're going to hit the reset button this year and have a new year with a new purpose, uh, it really comes down to Christianity being a way of life. Well, what does that look like? So I want to take you through very quickly this morning, Matthew 6. It's, it's, it looks like a lot of scripture, but it's actually one page in your Bible. Matthew 6, uh, it's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus is talking about a lifestyle that he wants us to live as believers, okay? Let's jump right in. So in Matthew 6, it's broken into three parts. The first part, 1 through 18, talks about outward and inward piety. The second part talks about the two treasures, the two eyes, and then the two masters, which we'll all have to deal with in this world. And then the third part is, is about trusting God uh, through all our needs and all our worries. You see, God knows what it's like to be human. Jesus came to the earth he, he lived the life that you and I live. He suffered and died. Hopefully, we won't suffer that kind of an ending. So, so when he's talking about these things, the gods or the powers or the entities or the worries, he knows what he's talking about. He lived it. He saw it happen. So Matthew 6. Uh, first one is outward and inward piety. Well, what does piety mean? We don't use that word too much. Piety simply means this. It means great devotion. That God says, listen, if you're going to follow me, you need to live a life of devotion, great devotion to me. And that's what piety means. So some people think piety means you wear robes, kind of like a Jawa in Star Wars. Anybody see the new Star Wars? Was it great or was it bad? Great. Okay, so, so a lot of people on, on 
the internet are lying about it because I'm hoping it's great. I haven't seen it. But, but a lot of people believe that, okay, so if I'm going to live a pious life or live in piety, I have to wear a robe. I don't talk to anybody. I'm just kind of, you know, I just walk around. I, I hum a lot. Mm, mm, you know, I'm thinking about Jesus all the time. But, but that's never what was intended by that. A life of great devotion is what piety means. And it shows up in three ways. So God says, listen, if you want to live the kind of life that I want you to, if you want to push the reset button, I want you to live a life of, of piety. And it will show up in your life in three ways. How you give to the needy, how you talk to me in prayer, and fasting. You ever heard anything about fasting? Fasting means mom didn't make any dinner tonight for most of us, right? But, but that God has a spiritual and physical purpose for fasting. So he, he tells us, listen, these things are important. If you're going to live like a believer, here's what I want you to do. And it will show up in three ways in your life. First verse in chapter six says, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others for you will lose the reward from your father in heaven. So God says, if you want to be like me, you're going to do good deeds for other people but if you're going to go around telling everybody about how great you are and what you've done for everybody, forget it. I'm not giving you anything. Wow. That's God being very direct with us, saying, you, you need to do this for me. This is a life of great devotion to me, not making you into some kind of spiritual giant. He goes on, when you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. And the only reward they're getting is how people look to them and go, oh, you're awesome. You, you do so much for everybody. You, you give to everybody. You, you're so nice to other people. He's saying, if that's what you want as a reward, that's what you'll get. And you will get nothing else from me. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Here's the thing about rewards with God. You'll get some here in this earth, and you'll get a lot of them uh, here in eternity. So in this short period of 80 years or whatever it's going to be for you, you're going to get some rewards. The first reward you're going to get is that it feels good to do for other people. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but it does. So when you do for other people, when you give to other people, when you, when you step out in faith and do something, for, it feels good. And, and you get this dopamine flow in your mind that goes, oh, yeah, I like that. And you start to make a habit of doing good because of the chemicals in your body, but also because of the spiritual calling in your body to be a Christian, to live like a Christian, and actually do for other people. And God says, I will reward you in this life and the next if this is a part of your life, if this is who you are. If you are pious, you will do for the needy. And then he goes on to teaching about prayer and fasting in verse 5. He says, when you pray, don't be like hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, this is all the reward they will ever get. He's saying, listen, what you see is religi religion, being very religious, you know, standing up and, and, and proclaiming who you are. Those people aren't going to get anything from me. That's not what I'm after. I'm after a connection. I'm after you allowing me to work through you. And I'm after you living a life of, of piety that says, God, I'm devoted to you. And it doesn't matter what anybody gives me or does not give me. This is not about me. This is about you. And that's what God is looking for in this. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly in the street corners and the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. This is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything, here it is again, will reward you. So, so if you want to be rewarded in this life and in eternity, you will develop a prayer relationship with God. So do things for the needy, pray, and fasting. Those are the three things that our piety will show up in. So he goes on and he says, pray like this. Now, here's, here's the important part, because when a lot of us talk about prayers, 
we get this real weird thing that kind of comes over us. Like, um, first of all, if you've never prayed in a group with Christians, it's really weird. And uh, I, I don't know if you ever stand in a circle and everybody holds hands. Like the first time I ever walked into a church where they're holding hands, I'm like, oh, well, I want to like take a step back. <laughs> Guys, just go ahead and do what you're going to do there. I'll wait back here. You know, the, the, there's the sweaty guy. His hands are just dripping. And, and, you're, and then there's the girl. Her hands are cold as ice. And you're standing there in the middle thinking, dear God, don't let anything happen here. I, I just don't know if I can take this. And, and then the prayer starts to go around a circle. And they do this weird thing. And when it's your turn, they squeeze this hand. And, and so now you're supposed to say something you've never prayed out loud. And so you utter a few words. And then you quickly squeeze this person's hand, hoping that they will just go on with their prayer, but they look at you and they go, do you have anything else to say? You know, so prayer can be quite weird, but, but maybe you've grown up where prayer is this long soliloquy um, where you, you look out your window and you stare into the sky and you recite, you know, 30 of these and 40 of those prayers. And God has something to say about that because that is not what he's looking for. He's looking for a personal connection. Here's what he says. He says, when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Then why do we need to ask him? Because he wants a relationship with us. He wants to know who we are. Funny thing about life, we can't know each other until we talk. What Larry said about small groups want your life to change, you get in a small group. I know it feels kind of weird sometimes depending on who's in your small group, but the truth is if you intersect your life with other people, your life will change. And that God wants our lives to change as we connect with him and through other people. So he says, listen, don't be like these people, but... Get together and pray. Talk to God. God wants a relationship. He says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, you've, you've probably heard this prayer when you have, have grown up, and it's just recited. He's not asking us to recite this. He's saying, here's the things you need to pray about. First, he says, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. He's saying, dear God, God, may you be the Lord of my life always. God, will, will you be the most powerful person, being that has ever existed? God, I need you in the life of my family. God, I need you in the life of our city. God, I need you to be Lord over our schools so that, so that we don't get lost. That's what he's saying in that first part. May our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's saying, pray about this. Pray that my kingdom in heaven will come to earth soon. And then pray that I will actually use you to do it. This is the sticky part. If God's kingdom is to come here on earth, and we are committed soldiers, we are committed pious people to his purpose in our life, who is he going to use to bring his kingdom here? You and me. You and me. You see, we can live our lives any way we want. We can live our lives like the rest of the world. We, we can do church on Sunday and then live like hell the rest of the week. It's true, we can. Or we can decide that God's purpose in me matters every single day with my kids, with, with my spouse, with, with the people I work with. No matter where I go, no matter what I do, Jesus is with me. He lives in me. He's working through me when I let him. And I want to absolutely change the culture of the things that are going on around me. And God wants to use me in that process. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. He's saying, listen, pray that you'll have enough food to make it through the day. Pray that you'll have dinner tonight. Pray that I will just simply pour out to you all of your needs. And then forgive us our sins as we have what? Already forgiven those who've sinned against us. He's saying, pray that, that I forgive you too because I believe you understand that you need to forgive so that I can forgive you. In fact, Scripture tells us that if you won't forgive somebody else, God will not forgive you. And that's the only way we can be free 
of the, the sin in our lives is to forgive others no matter what they've done. Forgiveness does not mean what you did is okay. Forgiveness means I'm going to let God deal with this. I'm not going to deal with it anymore. I'm not going to waste my time talking about you, thinking about you, worrying about you. I'm going to let God deal with that. And I'm going to forgive you. And God says, in that process, I will forgive you as well. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Do not take that lightly. Sometimes I see people whose lives are in turmoil. I mean, absolute turmoil. And it always comes back to, well, I'm not forgiving them. I can't. I won't. See, God will not bless your life. He won't change your life. He won't bring peace to your life until you forgive those people. And in that moment that you can forgive them, God will forgive you as well. It doesn't mean you're letting them off the hook. It means you're handing them off to God. It means you're saying, you know what? God, I will not be pinned to the wall by what happened to me anymore by what someone did to me anymore. I'm going to let go of that, and I'm going to let you deal with it. And when you fast, so he's going on, he's talking about prayer, and then he comes to fasting, he says, and when you fast. Why? Because he assumes that we fast. Two things happen when we fast. Physically, it's good for us. At our house, we fast our dogs every Sunday. Why? Because it's easier to fast our dogs than it is to fast Terry and I. We, we, ob <laughs> we object to fasting, Right? Uh, especially when there's meat on the table, but we fast our dogs. And what we've seen with our dogs is that they're healthier and they're happier by getting that one day physically just to, just to clean themselves out, nothing, you know, just water, and, uh, and, and then they're kind of moving on. But that, we do that re religiously every Sunday. Every Sunday, dogs don't eat. Uh, and yet there's a spiritual component. The spiritual component is this. If you're trying to really hear from God, Fasting opens the doors. Why? Because all we tend to think about each and every day is the clothes we're going to put on and the food we're going to put in our bellies. That's all we think about every day. Terry and I have been watching this um, uh, Netflix show, uh, Life Above uh, the Arctic. And, and, and they, do, they do two things. They cut wood for heat. They kill things for meat. That's their life. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? I mean, and so they're day in and day out. That's all they do. It's, it's, it's heat and, and food and water. So they're preparing. Their whole day comes down to making sure. So everything that they think all day long is about getting something to eat. And when you fast, it shifts your mind from being self-focused to being God-focused. In fact, scripturally, you'll see that, that Daniel, that a lot of people fasted. Uh, that fasting was a typical thing that people did, that Christians did, that believers did to clear their mind of themselves and say, okay, God, wh what are you saying to me? Well, what do you want me to do? So when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do, for they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I just laugh every time I read that. It's like, you know, the hair's all messed up, like, oh, I'm fasting today. I literally look bad, don't I? You know, I hope I make it to sundown. You know, I mean, that's kind of the picture I get. So he's saying, don't do that because that is the only reward you'll ever get. What? Reward from people going, oh, he's really cool. She's really cool. She, they fast. They fast. Don't they look terrible? They look like they've been fasting for 30 years, but it's only once a week for them. So uh, otherwise they're doing good. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Then no one will notice that you are fasting except your father. He's talking about a relationship that you let no one else into. And that fasting is part of that relationship. And you don't need to tell everybody else that you're fasting. You don't need to make a big deal out of it. It's just part of a pious life for a believer. So 19 to 24. So outward and inward piety. We looked at that. Here comes the second part. These two next parts are quicker. Two treasures, two eyes, and two masters. So if we're going to live a life of Christianity, we're going to help the needy, we're going to pray, and we're going to fast. He says, these are the things you must do. Then, verse 19, he says, don't store up treasures here on earth, 
Now, this is simple. He's saying, listen, stop putting so much value in stuff that's going to rot or fall away or break down. Stop putting so much value in your house. Stop putting so much value in other people. These things are not going to live forever. Do the things that you need to do because those things will last forever. What things last forever? What he was talking about being pious, connection with God, doing for the needy, those things last forever. When you do something for the needy, it absolutely contains change the, change the trajectory of, of generations of people. And, and when you're connected with God, that will change your daily life and your eternal life. And, and fasting just gives you greater clarity in that process. So don't store up treasures here on earth. Store your treasures in Heaven. What does he mean by that? Do the things that will last forever. There is only one thing that will last forever in your entire life. One thing. And that's what you do for Jesus. And what you do for Jesus is always connected to people. Oh, no. You see, God, I want to build you a kingdom. I want to build you a hospital. I wanted to... But what good is a hospital you build that, that doesn't impact people's lives? What good is education that doesn't impact people's lives? Storing your treasures in heaven means that because you love God, you're going to do for other people. It's that simple. You see, you can't have a relationship with God apart from other people. That's why God got this thing called a church. He brought people together as a church. So what? So that we would come together to impact people's lives, impact the needy, that we'd pray together, that we'd learn his word together, and that essentially we would be a organism of the body of Christ that together we could do more than we could separately. Some of you, the greatest thing you have to offer in your daily life is being able to, to, to change somebody's oil. There's a guy in this church an older gentleman, doesn't have much money, doesn't have much of anything, and yet he has spent all kinds of hours fixing people's houses, working, uh, getting their bathrooms working, getting their heating, cooling working, change it and put a starter on an old beat-up van for somebody who didn't have the money to do it. And I mean, his life is connected to doing for others, and those are the things that will last forever. God sees it, God hears it, and he stores up a treasure for him in eternity. Now, if he'd done those things for himself because he was selfishness, there is no gain. But that which we do for other people will last forever. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. So what we see, he's saying, listen now. He's saying, what you see and do matters. You can't live like hell and hope that things change. You must decide what is the important thing. What is the thing that matters? And when my eyes are healthy, then everything else in my life is going to be healthy. When your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. I was meeting with a couple at one, one time, and, and uh, you, you don't know them, and uh, they, they gave me this incredible story of all the things that was wrong. I didn't have enough fingers or toes. Um, and we don't hear to be able to say, look, here's all the stuff that was wrong. And how do we fix all this? And it looks like it's just all going to go in the garbage can and life is bad and blah, blah, blah. I said, um, so, okay, let me just be honest with you. Do you go to church? No. Uh, do you read God's word? No. Uh, do you uh, have anybody who would be a spiritual counselor that could help you? No. And I said, then you have no hope. You see, beyond that component of those three things, you have no hope. Beyond that component of those three things, you can go to the store and you get a self-help book and you can enjoy that and you can read that and it's the latest, greatest idea about how to help yourself, but it is not going to change your situation because you completely block God out of your life. People say, well, I'm not going to make my kids go to church. I'm not going to force religion down their throat. You force broccoli down their throat, liver. You know, I was forced to eat liver. But somehow when it comes to the most important thing in their life, whether they'll live or die and spend eternity with Jesus, we don't want to be pushy. 
You don't have to be pushy, but you can be clear about the truth. If you believe it's the truth, why wouldn't you share that truth with them? Why wouldn't you lead them to that truth? Living a Christian life is about not being ashamed of what God has said to us and conducting ourselves in such a way that other people sense and hear the Spirit of God in us, through us, and around us. And it is that same with our household. What we see with our eyes affects our heart. What we see with our eyes absolutely determines whether we're healthy or whether not healthy. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. A lot of people will go to church on Sunday, and the rest of the week there is no God. The rest of the week there is no other relationship. I'm not praying, I'm not reading his word, I'm not connecting. And then they simply say, you know what, it's not working. Well, it's not working because you haven't done it the way God wants us to do. We have to take care of the needy. We have to pray and connect with him and read his word. And we have to be the kind of people who would fast and come together to do God's will in us, through us, and around us. The last part this morning, just very quickly. Trust in God through our needs and worries. God has got your back. You've been told in your life that if you don't do it, nobody's going to. You've been told that you've got to be a man, that you've got to be this kind of person that takes charge, that gets it all done. But let me tell you something, you have failed and failed and failed again until this moment. And God has made sure that you've made it here. You didn't make it here to this moment because you're wise and because you're smart. Your marriage hasn't survived because you're a master of relationships. But that God has worked in and through you, in your hearts and in your minds to make sure that Your life continues. Your world continues. In spite of all the problems. At the end of 2017, I take a a long list and I look back at the last 40, 50 years of my life. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of places where I said, I shouldn't have made it any further. That should have been the end of me. That should have been the end of my life. That should have been the end of my marriage. That should have been the end. Should have been the end of this. Should have been the end of that. But God has been faithful. Just simply put, we spend way too much time worrying about things. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? intellectually I can say well yes I agree with that but on a practical level am I living like that do I walk around the house just worried about everything saying we're not going to make it it's not going to happen what if we freeze to death what if we don't have enough food what if this happens what if Joe and Mary do that what if this is that the kind of life I live see what I'm saying becomes self-fulfilling prophecy in my life and if the light in me is Christ, then what comes out of me must also be Christ. Your attitude absolutely affects how you'll walk through this world, how you'll walk through today, how you're going to walk through tomorrow. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? What if you came to the realization that, you know what, you got this far because Jesus brought you here? And he isn't giving up on you. And he's going to assure that you get to the end. And because you put yourself in his hand, he's going to ensure that you get to eternity with him. What would it do in your world with your problems and your circumstances if you say, God, I know you got this. And I'm not just thinking this, I'm saying it. And now I'm acting like it. I'm not saying stay at home and don't do your job, don't do your work. You've got to do that. I'm saying that God will give you everything you need. And if you think you got here to this point by any other means than his hand, you're mistaken. Every day, we see all kinds of people who check out of this world, either by their own hand or by the hands of other people. And the only reason that we're not one of them is because Jesus 
is who he says he is because he holds our lives. Nobody can remove you from this world. Think about this until God says it's time. Nobody, no army, no country, no military, nothing can take your life until God says, I'm ready for it. Because God is who he says he is. So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? C.S. Lewis says, if we let ourselves down, if we let ourselves, we shall always be waiting for some distraction or other to end before we can really get down to work of living like a Christian. The only people who achieve much are those who want knowledge so badly that they seek it while the conditions are still unfavorable. Favorable conditions will never come. There's never going to be a better day. You're not gonna ever get it all together. You're not gonna finally come to that moment where you go, okay, it's the right time to have a baby. You see, you have to come to the point where you just sincerely believe that God's got this. He says, all this worry, all these problems, these things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, people who don't know Jesus. People who don't know where their eternity is going. That's all these people think about. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Doing the things you need to do. Praying. Connecting with God. Taking care of the needy. Doing for other people. In fact, Jesus summed it all up by these two things. He said, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? who you're sitting next to now, who you sit next to in the car, who you live next to in your home, who you walk next to at the grocery store. Anybody we meet at any moment, those are our neighbors. And he's saying, take care of these people for this is where my power will be realized. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Matthew 6 is a way of life for us as believers in Jesus. It's how we're to live. It's how we're to operate. It's how we are to think. It's what matters. Maybe today, what you just need to say is, you know what, I'm gonna start over. Reset button, boop. Last year was a bad one didn't really work out. Maybe my faith, my relationship with God has been less than I hoped it would be. It's not really working for me. God, can I start over? You certainly can. And you start over by asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life. The Lord means he's the boss. Means I'm going to read his word. I'm going to do what he says. Means I'm going to come into community with other believers. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to wrestle with my thoughts and my feelings and my life. And we're going to do that together. And at the end of our lives, we're going to walk out of this place knowing that God never gave up on us. He was always there. And that life is just beginning when the rest of the world thinks it's ending. Let me pray with you this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people. God, thank you for their families. Lord, it's tough to be a parent. It's tough to to manage in this world that is so driven towards all of this stuff. Father, you tell us there's nothing wrong with having stuff, but that we would hold it loosely. That we would see it come and go without even a care. And that what we would value most is your connection in our life. God, I ask you right now for those people who are unsure that they would take that step and commit themselves to you today. And for those parents who are struggling to say, what does it look like to bring Jesus into our family? That they would begin that with maybe just a prayer around the table before they eat. Maybe a prayer of concern what's going on at school. Let me, let me pray with you about your test. Let me, let me pray with you about your help. And, and Lord, that we would take care of the needy around us, both locally and afar, that you would use us to absolutely make a difference in this world. Bless these people in this new year. 
absolutely give them the greatest connection with you and the change in their life that would demonstrate that you are who you say they are. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. This final song.